say. Hi, I'm Jeannie Adams. Welcome to the Continual Panel Room. Tonight we're going to talk about witchy fiction with some fabulous authors from all over the country. And we're going to start with introductions. Uh, I'm, as I said, Jeannie Adams. I write the Witches Walk series and several other series that feature witches. And um, I'm going to have Pat Rice introduce herself. I don't know how long you want me to talk, but <laughs> I write witches who are who call themselves druids. Um, my series tend to be have magic in the name, but uh, basically they are psychic women. Um, I have the my most recent one is the School of Magic series. Uh, previous ones are the Unexpected Magic, and right now there is a sale on. The first book in the Crystal Magic series, which is contemporary, which is unusual for me. But uh, we do call them witches because in Georgian and Regency times, they didn't have psychic as a word. So, you know, they were strong women who talked too much. You know? <laughs> and they're all fabulous. Rachel, what about you? Uh, so my name is Rachel Graves, and I also write witch fiction. Uh, so my one series is the Death Witch series, and my other series is Elizabeth Hicks Witch Detective. So uh, I'm also a Wiccan neo-pagan and have been practicing for about 30 years now, which is frightening. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of my life every day. That's great. Ceresia, what about you? Um, for me, sorry, for me, um, I write... Um, I have witches in my Shadow Chasers universe. Um, I just had a, uh, a novella that I put out with uh, Jeannie uh, with Christmas in Canem Castle that featured a witch who reads tea leaves and also uh, does healing potions with teas. So um, I, I've very, been very kind of deep into that. And also I have my dog decided to get <laughs> his squeaky toy out. Sorry about that. Um, and I also have um, my Sons of Anubis series, which their their main antagonists, which aren't really, are the daughters of Isis, who are Isis priestesses, and they have various different kinds of aspects of Isis in their magic. Nice. And they're so good. Stuart, what about you? Hi, everybody. I'm Stuart Jaffe. Uh, I'm best known for the Max Porter Paranormal Mysteries, which are about a guy who moves to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and discovers his office is haunted by the ghost of a 1940s detective. So he does what anyone in that situation would do and starts a detective agency with a ghost, as you do. And uh, I take real history of the area and I mix it with witches and ghosts and curses and magic. So cool. So cool. Well, one of the things I wanted us to talk a little bit about is how the witches in your stories fuel their magic. And this story, this aspect of the question actually came from being on a panel with Rachel and her talking about how her witches fueled their magic. So I'm actually going to start with her. Uh, so my witches are fueled by sugar, blood sugar. <laughs> um, so a lot of them are fueled by candy bars or Coca-Cola or uh, Dr. Pepper. Um, they do have gods and goddesses that they can call upon and maybe they'll get the extra boost. Uh, but normally it's the glucose packet, cherry flavored glucose packet in their uh, squad car or in their bottom of their purse. And they do have a horrible tendency of passing out if they haven't paid attention to what they're eating before they do a bunch of magic. I just think that's so cool. <laughs> it's cool. Ceresia, what about your uh, witches? How are they, how do they fuel their magic? Um, a variety of different ways. In the um, Sons of Anubis um, series, the first one, Seducing J the Jackal, um, my uh, main um, heroine in that story uh, is fueled by sex. Ooh. So, because that's the kind of story that ended up being. So, they, um, like I said, they take all of the different aspects of Isis, and one of those is the whole fertility angle. Um, so, for hers, it's powered through. Um, yeah, through sex and good times. The <laughs> orgasms fuels her power. That and burgers. Lots of burgers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to keep the protein level up to get exactly. everything else moving, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sir, what about you? Uh, in my Max Porter series, the witches tend to work on a more ritualistic than than fueling themselves in any way. It's it's. Uh, I, I think on one book I actually explicitly say, state this, that it's, it's like uh, an electric eel, which gets its ener electric eels get their charge from the electrons that's in the water around them. So it's just 
magic is just harnessing the energy that's already among, amongst us all. And so they have a lot of traditional things with casting circles and candles and things like that. And, and they have their, their spells that they recite, but it's all just a matter of focusing, trying to focus the energy around them and utilize it that way. But I didn't mention it in my intro, but I actually have a trilogy I'm writing for Falstaff books, which is an epic fantasy mixed with modern kind of contemporary mystery uh, ideas. And there are witches in this. They're, well, they're called witches. They're, it's a secondary, you know, uh, it's a fictitious epic fantasy world. But those witches, in order to fuel their magic, uh, they have to make a sacrifice and part of bones and dead material and things. But one of the things they have to sacrifice is a tooth, one of their own teeth. Um, and the more teeth, the more complicated the spell, the more teeth they have to sacrifice. So they're very limited in how many spells they can ever do in their lifetime. And, uh, and uh, as a result, if you ever come across one and she only has a few teeth left, you're looking at somebody who knows how what she's doing and you better watch yourself. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Do implants. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Pat? Uh, as I said, my witches aren't traditional witches. Um, they are gifted women. And as, as you say, the energy, they do pull on the energy, the earth's energy. When I first started writing these women, uh, I tried to do it from a scientific basis because my heroes were scientific men. So they would try to understand how their energy created their, their various, they, they could read auras, or one of them would uh, paint dead people or, or they could smell emotion. Because smelling, you can't, you know, even dogs can smell illnesses uh, in people. So the sense of smell is extremely sensitive. So I tried to work with that to start with. But as time went on, I have a couple of dozen of these books, and you can only pull on the energy thing so much. So we have sexual energy involved in there a little bit. And, and you know, there's, uh, it's it just, it's an innate gift that is fueled by something within them that they pull from other people or th what they're touching. So if there's a ghostly energy in a rock, then they can pull that, that, that bit of psychic, whatever the word is that I'm missing, that's, that, that, is it, that yeah, has been pressed into that rock. So I won't say that they have candy and burgers in emergency times. So <laughs> it's, I just love that, Rachel. I do love that. The sugar, the sugar thing just cracks me up. <laughs> and of course, having read Ceresias, I love that. I love the sex magic too. That's great. Um, my my series all use sort of the innate gifts and like Stuart said, Stuart said the sort of ambient magic in the world. But why do you think witches as the subject for stories continue to be so popular? Ceresia? Save me up. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. It's always seems like it's been a part of our lexicon, you know, from the, the burning times and the Salem witch trials and uh, you know, because it's been a male-dominated society, it's easy to demonize with, uh, women who want to be independent or think for themselves, or, you know, it's easier to get rid of them by claiming that they're practicing witchcraft or have been possessed by the devil. Um, so being able to kind of take that back, and then you have, you know, Sabrina, the teenage witch, you've got Charmed, you've got all sorts of different, um, the Witches of Eastwick, all kinds of different stories that have kind of made a lasting impression um, in, in popular culture. So I think it's kind of, just kind of come back into, it's a way for women to seize power and be powerful and be independent and do things in their own right. And so those are attractive qualities, especially for, you know, um, people are looking for role models, not saying that, you know, some bad witches or whatever are role models, but, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> well, but then again, you know, they've got the wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I just think that it's, it's just kind of been, you know, looking for heroines of their own story and witches with their power seem to seize that. And I think that that makes it very popular. You're gone, Jean. You want to put something in? Wait, you just came back. I came back? Oh, that's nice of them. 
Hey, Stuart, what about you? What, what would your answer be to that question? I think this is, I, I could get in a lot of trouble if I answer that question. <laughs> Um, so I, no, I'd agree, I certainly agree with, with what, what's been said, but I, I would also add that, um, you know, which is like, uh, uh, vampires and, and sorcerers and all the, you know, these things go back so far and in all cultures and, uh, and come out of, a lot of times very natural real things so i obviously i think witches um are born out of uh, uh cultures where women were um tended to were tending the land discovering what hey if this plant will cure a headache this plant will you know and and of course that's magic to everybody uh and and then you get into power plays, which is why I think they become witches become dangerous because when the the chief, if if you have a a, a patriarchy in a group and the chief has he has all the power and he sees that everybody's going to, you know, Mrs. Jones down the street because she's the only one who can actually heal them, that threatens his power, and so that and it, you can see how this snowballs very quickly into um demonizing witches uh and you know just like and just like any kind of witch doctor or anything like that um so i i find that kind of fascinating and 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 then looking at history even you look at contemporary times where there are there are plenty of people who have been trying to take that back and uh you know the 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 I was about to say the rise of the Wiccan movement, but it's been there forever. But it's certainly the acceptance of it, I guess I should say, along with the acceptance of all sorts of things and people and cultures that were until recently shoved aside. And I, I think that's been really interesting um, change in it and uh, has, has led to the growth in recent times of, of people like us being able to write about it and not have all the witches be evil. Right. I'm so pleased in the last few years that everything has, has turned more to the witches being good. <laughs> Still not working. Okay. <laughs> Pat, can you take the next one? I can't hear you. Can what is your <laughs> what is <laughs> So I think the question was about the innate appeal of witches, Pat? Innate appeal of witches, okay. <laughs> uh, I think we all want to believe in magic, um, that, that we can change, that we ourselves can change the world. And uh, we probably do have that ability to change the world if we dredge up the best of ourselves and we go out and tutor a child or, or prepare meals for the hungry. And that is a means of changing the world, but that, and it makes a difference. But people want the, the sparkly glittery, you know, the things they see in the movies, that, 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 you know, that sort of thing. So the, they don't want the mundane magics. They, they want the, the, the little, like little girls want to be princesses. Uh, they want witches who can be dramatic, who can be badass, who can be, you know, the, things that we aren't inherently. And, uh, you know, it just, it gives us, it makes it sound like we would have control over the world. Like uh, we could zap the toad and turn him into a prince so we can take him to the wedding with us. You know, that kind of thing. and I think a lot of our tales do show that the, the prince might be more trouble than he's worth. But, you know, so showing both sides of, of what the power of magic. But I think it's that control issue. We want to be able to control our lives. And a little bit of magic goes a long way. So while Jeannie gets our audio together, I will jump in. Um, I think for me, we don't see any other archetypes of female power that are not based on being granted that power from someone in authority. I don't think we have anything other than witches that I can think of where it's a woman claiming her own power. And I think there's a lot that attracts us to that idea in the world where a lot of our power is granted, even though we, you know, we might wanna say we earned it, um, we wouldn't get that power without someone else. So I think there's the, an independence and a connection with the earth that we don't see in other concepts and other traditional ideas 
of women. You know, the empress is only in charge because she married the emperor. And the mother is only powerful because she had the child, whereas the witch is powerful because she's the witch. And I think that appeals to a lot of folks. And I'm just going to say that I'm using witch as a gender non-specific term. So I, I, I would include male witches in that as well. Thing. Okay, on the next thing. Well, it also begs the question is, you know, in the early stories, especially the, the very scary initial versions of the fairy tales, and you sort of touched on this, Stuart, the, the witches are the bad guys always. They're, they're the evil ones. They're the ones who... Now, some of that has got to be perception because they're the woman who stole power, right? So evil is a perception of the writer as opposed to whether it's truly evil or not. But it seems to have shifted more in our current writing to be, you know, the good witch, the more beloved one, the, the one who, who helps everybody kind of make their way in the world. And even in some of the older tales, you see that the witch is the tester, not necessarily the bad guy, but the one who sets you the test. And if you pass it, you get rewarded. If you don't, you get the stick. So, you know, there's both the why are they loved and why are they hated. And I think we've already touched a little bit on why they're hated in the sense of most of the pa patriarchy. It's the power struggle. But in your perception, why are they loved in the sense of, we all love the mystery and the idea that the common man could have power. But what are some other things that make witches beloved characters, either in your world or in some others? Stuart, why don't we start with you? Well, um, it's interesting, in, in, in the world I create, most of the witches, the witches are, how do I say this? They're all evil, but they're not evil. They're, they're, they're the, they are bad. They are the bad guys most of the time. But Max's wife is, uh, has been studying witchcraft and she's trying to prove that, and, and she's correct, that witchcraft is neutral. It's just a, it's what you do with it. It's, it's, you know, and, and so she's trying to, to be good with it. It's also a very, it's a very powerful, at least in my books. So it's, it's the uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely kind of thing. So you have to be, that's where you have to be really careful. If you suddenly have the actual power to create spells that will see the future or, you know, kill an enemy or whatever, that's, that's heady stuff. And so I, I, that really, will tend to bring out the worst of any human being, I think. Um, so, but she's trying to, anyway, she's trying to be a good witch about it. And I, and, and I, th I think that's fine. I find that part of it fascinating that it's just, it just is, you know, it, it, it's, it's a neutral thing and it's what you as a human being bring to it. That's going to make you make it or you a good or bad witch. I don't know if that even answered your question, but it's where my thoughts went to. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's something we all, those of us who write it and those people who read our books, they love the character of the witch. And they're popular for obvious reasons. And we've seen more and more of it on television. And I think you're right, Stuart, it's become much more acceptable to have them be the good guy. Um, but, you know, they're we all of us i think can speak to why a witch is the witch as an icon is hated why are they loved and is Cerisi, i know you in your books they are very highly regarded yeah i try to um you know in my shadow chasers books especially there's light and shadow and then there's the in between so my witches are kind of charged with making sure that they put out as much light as possible to balance the shadow so that you know the world can kind of stay in the balance uh, as much as possible. So that's kind of their charge passed down mother to daughter to um, make sure they put good out into the world. So they're helping people um, in different ways, using their powers to the best of their abilities to create good and spread the good. So, so and I Rachel, yeah. Rachel, what about you? What do, what do you see that as the, the, the reason they're loved or would be loved if you're writing them that way? So the way I'm writing them, um, my witches are often the only people who can help. 
And to me, that's something we've seen historically with a lot of the fairy tales that you go to the witch when you need something outside the bounds of normal society. When you're at that point where you're desperate and you really need help, the witch is going to be there, um, whether it's with a potion or, or whatever it is, she's got an option for you when you're at your last. And in my books, my, um, my spirit witch who's a detective is constantly getting called on by ghosts who need her to go do something and she's really their only option. And my cop who's a death witch is helping to solve murders. So it's really about the witch being someone who can help no matter how desperate the situation is. And I think, you know, that's something we all wish we had in the world. So it's very much that fantasy fulfillment of, I've been in desperate times, maybe we're all in desperate times now. And we wish there was somebody who could wave their hand or, you know, wiggle their nose and magically make it better. Pat, what do you think? Uh, if we're just speaking about our own personal witches, not all the fun ones that I've read, <laughs> is, uh, I think, what Rachel is saying is what resonates that uh, they are people who help. I mean, my Malcolms are healers. They're, my Malcolms are the, are the Druid descendants, uh, witches, whatever you want, psychics, whatever. Uh, they, they, they're the ones who can talk to the ghost and find out why the ghost is angry. Yeah. You know, they, they have the ability to do things that other people can't. I have uh, in the new series, uh, one who's, it's, it's a Victorian series, so we're into photography now, and her, her, her ability to focus on abused women is her gift, but she catches it with her photography. Uh, and no, cool. so because she knows these women are abused, she has the ability to help them. Whereas in Victorian society, nobody would have admitted you know, to abuse, no matter, you know, much less have somebody recognize it and do something about it. So it's, the, the women are beloved simply because they can help, whether or not anyone believes they are actually witches. So, right. you know. Yeah. If you Rachel, want, I think, <laughs> go on. Rachel, I think you've touched on a really interesting point, though, is that in so many stories, the witch, at least the older stories, the witch is your person of last resort. Mm -hmm which mm -hmm. is why they're both loved and hated. Mm -hmm. Because if you're in that bad of a scenario, the person you have to turn to at the last possible moment is the only solution. You may not like them very much. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially because I think the witches, generally speaking, are operating outside of, mm -hmm. of, the, of, society, of the norm, certainly of the norm, and outside, you know, on the, of the society or of the law or however you want to look at it. Right. So by the nature of you, that being a last resort, you're, you, you're already having to step outside of, of what is acceptable by your, by your family, by the people you love, you know, all that kind of thing for most people. And, and, uh, and that has risk with it, which is also what makes them good for stories because right. you got risk with it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I well, think I oh, go ahead, Rachel. I was just going to say, I think that what we see here is when you're at your last resort, that person can extract a terrible price. Mm -hmm. you, they know you have no place else to go. And so they can say, well, I'm going to take your firstborn or, or something equally horrible, right? And you have no choice but to go along with it. And that puts people in a position of powerlessness and nobody likes that. Nobody wants to be there. Well, nobody wants to believe in magic. I mean, when you're dealing with, you know, reality, you know, you don't want to believe this person can actually talk to this ghost. You think the person's having hallucinations and that you're having hallucinations. You know, you don't want to believe you're crazy. You don't want to believe this person is crazy. But, you know, at some point you have to believe and trust and put faith in someone else. And that's tough. Yeah. yeah can, can you imagine doing it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think too, you've got the scenario of not only are you at the last resort, but you're also, as Stuart says, stepping outside the norm. And yet we, we all want to be, we have that balance of needs is we all want to be accepted in the norm. And yet we all want to be special. <laughs> so I think we all sort of like have this sort of thing of, wow, wouldn't that be cool? I think, that's, I think that's one reason why I don't know how you all feel about it, but the, the most recent iteration of Sabrina, the teenage witch uh, is exactly about what you're saying. You know, she is special. 
extremely powerful and she is seduced by that and wants that. But at the same time, she wants to just be a teenager and have a boyfriend and, and be normal. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's the thrust of the show most of the time is that tug of war. Yeah. I think that was the thrust of Buffy too. Yeah. 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 Was, you know, I want to be normal. And in, in Buffy's case, it's like, I am normal. I'm, you know, the head cheerleader on this. And wait, what? I'm supposed to do what? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think I, I was going to ask Sarissa because you said you, you're passing power down mother to daughter. Yes. And so if your mother is abnormal, your rebellion is to be super normal, right? <laughs> right. And I've had some where the mother was the powerful one and the first daughter it passes from mother to first daughter. Um, and, you know, uh, one of my characters grew up thinking that she was not going to be able to, that she was going to get disowned because she didn't have the power that her mother had. And actually just, it's just meant that it came, she got hers later in life, but she grew up with all of the pressure of being the first daughter, supposed to inherit everything and, you know, basically direct the family. And she's, didn't have any magic that she felt and her sisters came up behind her and had more power and so that created this kind of friction amongst everybody and wanting to you know uh, choose a second set of mothers and daughters to take over the family because obviously she wasn't going to uh, be able to uh, inherit the titles so yeah it, it can create uh, a lot of stresses and, you know, being able to explore those family dynamics, the sister dynamic as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's been interesting to kind of navigate that. The, the wanting to be normal, you know, it's like, well, if I don't have any um, powers then I'm going to go live the most normal life that I can marry somebody who isn't aware of our family and our gifts and try to have a normal life, a normal child. And then of course she gets dragged back in um, because, you know, once, her magic awakens, then that's pretty much the path that she's going to be on. So, yeah, if we always strive to want to be normal and want to be special, it's, it's kind of that the whole Gemini thing, trying to be in two worlds at once. Yeah. Well, and, and that drive to, okay, everybody in my family is so weird. <laughs> I just, I just want to be the normal one. The normal and one. yet, those best stories, of course, which is what we're about is, well, no, sorry, you don't get to be the normal one. <laughs> and I'm sure for your witches too, Rachel, that means, you know, if you have to eat certain ways or you have to have certain things and carry in your purse, right? Well, what if you don't want to carry a purse that day? <laughs> And I think that's something that for my witches becomes a, a constant sort of battle of, I want to be normal. I don't want to carry a purse today. I don't want to, you know, one of my witches who sees ghosts is forever talking to ghosts as if they were just normal people. And then having someone point out that person's a ghost. Um, so I think there's that dichotomy of, I want to be normal, but this is my normal and I'm going to flout like tradition and I'm going to do what I want and, and defiance. I think defiance is part of witchcraft saying, you know, today I refuse to take care of myself because I don't want to be bothered. And then of course that always goes badly, which is a lot of fun. Well, and that cauldron of conflict, if you'll excuse the way you reference, <laughs> is, is where we set our stories. So, you know, and Pat, I know your crystal witches have a lot of conflict with their magic, right? Well, yes, because they're in contemporary times. And of course, we're right. all, you know, we're bookkeepers or we're nurses or we're, you know, practical people living in a real world. And, you know, you don't just suddenly start talking to ghosts or uh, without <laughs> freaking people out. Look, people looking at you oddly. <laughs> yeah, very oddly. So that that that's one of the reasons with that that particular series, the, the Crystal Magic series, I created an entire town up in the hills of California where they can go and, and, and it's normal for them to be weird. You know, and people just accept, well, this is a weird town, you know, it's got weird people. And in California, you know, it's, just, <laughs> it's allowed, you're allowed to be weird. So they're comfortable in this own community by themselves. But if they leave this community, they're in, you know, dire straits because they start, you know, behaving normally for them and it's not normal to the people. 
normal population. So yeah, there's there, and then of course you've got the the, the mixture of people. You do have the normals in the town that tend to be evil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so and you have the, the kids who do want to be, you know, witches, and they're not, and they're they're trying to practice magic. You know, do the things kids do to practice magic. And it's, you know, if, if there's when you ever you have families and people pulled together, you're going to have fun conflicts when you deal with the weird. <laughs> That's sort of what I did too. Is I set up to an entire town that is the witches that left Salem before the witch trial. <laughs> They got they got out ahead of the storm, yeah. So, nice and and formed their own town, but it's become more and more popular and more accepted as Stuart was indicating earlier in popular culture. So we're seeing the rise of a lot of television programming, uh, HBO programming, all across all platforms as well as in books of the supernatural. Um, we went through a period in the seventies and eighties early 90s where there weren't a lot of supernatural books and then suddenly there were vampires and suddenly there were werewolves and shifters and you know that's been a real sort of gradual rise in some areas and witches have sort of been kind of the tail end of that there was a whole lot of vampires and a whole lot of werewolves especially in the romance community um, and of course science fiction and fantasy has always had that their share of that but I think we've really seen a rise of the witch as a more popular heroine and sometimes anti-hero, uh, as you were saying, Stuart, with the, the, the reboot of Sabrina. What are some of y'all's favorites in terms of books, movies, television um, that you're seeing in popular culture these days? Theresia? Oh, dear. Um, I always draw a blank because there's so many things that I watch. Um, well, one of the ones that I watched, and I'm really, really sad that this is over uh, or that it only lasted one season. Um, Sci-Fi had a show called Superstition. I know, see, probably nobody even remembers that. It was this family. Uh, it was set in, in Louisiana. I can't remember what parish it was, but it was a family where the um, father was kind of semi sort of immortal he was made immortal to protect this magic and so basically the whole family um kind of bonds together to fight evil and fight demons so it was a i really really love that show i live tweeted it and i was very sad that it only got uh one um one season it was uh mario van peoples was uh the uh, played the father and it was just it was a great multicultural cast and the mayor of the town was a demon but he was kind of doing good so they kind of had this agreement that he could keep on doing his thing as long as the body count wasn't too high or something it was just really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so i just really enjoyed that one and that one just stays with me the most i just like the way that they kind of um even secondary characters had who were quirky also had power and that you didn't know that they had power until it came time for them to kind of rise up and stand up. So it was really great and I really miss that show. It was probably two years ago, I think, uh, when it was canceled. So it only ran for one season on Sci-Fi, but I really loved that one. Rachel, what about you? Um, so I'm gonna say Midnight Texas which also I didn't, didn't give us enough, but I really loved that representation of the witch as someone who brings the community together and knows herb lore and has learned again, passed down in the family and has an amazing, awesome kitty familiar um, because I really wise ass cats are my true love. Um, but lately it's been the order for me and, and I'm, I'm really passionate about this show because I just love the way that they're showing witches has organized and diverse and in just a neat organization, I, working towards maybe something evil, maybe something good, going back and forth, a lot of great moral quandaries. I love in the order that you don't know. No, which is you how don't life know whether, <laughs> yeah. You don't know whether they're ultimately good or ultimately bad or both. Yeah. I like that. Pat, what about you? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not a very much of a TV person. I only usually have a few hours in the evening to, to do fun things, and so I read. And, so uh, yeah, books. I mean, tell books. tell me about your books that you you love. Uh, well, Pratchett's witches are my absolute favorite. I mean, they these are women who know have their knowledge, 
They go out, they use their knowledge, they, they make no apology, they're going to change the world if it's necessary to change the world, and they're going to stay and take care of their garden if that's, you know, all they need to do. I just, you know, they're, they're my ultimate witches. Um, uh, I like humor, I like the chick literary type of uh, witches. I like uh, Mindy Klasky's, um, what is it, the, the Washington Witches, and uh, Julia Blackwell has a great witch mystery series. And, and it's, it's women dealing, you know, just like my contemporary witches, dealing with the, the normal with uh, slightly different perspectives. You know, yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. I love Madeline Alt's uh, witchy series, uh, mystery series, too. They're real cute. They're just very light and cute, but uh, they're really good. What about you, Stuart? Um, Movie, TV, show... books? What? Movies, well, TV, with books? TV, yeah, so two TV series came to mind. One, one I don't, I don't, I, I'm not done with it yet, so I don't know where it's going, but my wife and I have been watching this show called The Gift, which is... Uh, one of the great things about Netflix and all the streaming services is now we're getting shows from all over the world. And this is a Turkish show uh, about this woman who is a, it's almost, it's a very classic setup. She's a, about to get married to the richest guy in Turkey. Who's the son of this, you know, really overpowering, almost mobster kind of father and, but but everything seems perfect in her life. She's this artist, but she keeps drawing this one symbol over and over. And quickly, you she discovers that her grandmother is this mystical, who she thought was dead, of course, is this mystical woman. And, and it's all connected with uh, apparently one of the oldest or the oldest temple that's ever been found is in Turkey. And so they keep going to that excavation. I don't know where it's all going, but the witch is the grandmother and she's awesome. And clearly the this the main character she has got power and she it's a it's a discovery thing of like that and it's really what makes it interesting it's a bit soapy but what makes the show interesting is that in one hand one hand you have very traditional storytelling elements that we all know from fairy tales and from everything you can think of but it's all told from a turkish point of view which i have no idea what that is until i start watching this and and you can see it's a, it's a modern Turkish point of view because there's certainly a very patriarchal uh, uh, aspect to it. But the story is about the main character is the, the woman at the center of it and her fighting against all that. And it's, it's just fascinating. So I really am enjoying that. Um, on, the other si on the other side, I've, I've always enjoyed the show The Magicians, which has some of the most gonzo stuff all over. It, goes, it gets so whacked out. It's funny, but... At, at the same time, you get all the kinds of witches. You have everything from highly respected uh, scholarly witches to hedge witches who are, you know, on the periphery fighting the system and everything in between. And that's kind of neat from a witch point of view. Yeah. That's one of the things I liked about Buffy is that they, they really kind of ran the gamut until they had Willow actually become a witch. They sort of ran the gamut from the really bad ones to, here's the, like you said, the hedge witches that are kind of just some just dabbling, some very serious and very effective in their own way. And, uh, and then the really bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's been done a lot in books too, where you see uh, like Barb Hindi did, which is that they, uh, in her Miss Torn Witches series, where in some countries they're highly respected, highly regarded, highly paid. And in other countries they're hunted. And she sort of shows the, the gamut there, and I've enjoyed her books. Um, obviously, I've read y'all's and enjoyed all of them, too. So, Rachel, I've just started yours, so, and enjoying the heck out of it. So. Um, what are some other books or, or uh, shows that you like that feature witches? So, I, I just want to throw a plug in for Molly Harper's uh, Half Moon Hollow yeah. series. I love the way she handles witches because it's not that she has witches that are all across the board. Like I got my powers by staring a stealing a fairy's something and <laughs> I got my powers here. And it's just neat to see her bring all that together. Um, I'm trying to think, I just finished three books in the Iron Druid Chronicle series that again, I said before, I'm a sucker for cute pets. There's an amazing Irish wolfhound in that series. So I read the first book uh, six days ago and I'm on the fourth book now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to devour a series 
And then Alyssa Day has some really fun, um, quirky, small town mysteries where which is a prominent role. So that's also one of the ones I'm waiting for her next book at the end of this month. Cool. Anybody else? Teresa, you mentioned a show. Are there some books that you I like that we can? I knew you were going to ask me that. I was trying to rack my brain. It's, um, I, my TBR uh, pile is long and my memory is short. Yes. Um, <laughs> I had the same problem, yes. <laughs> well, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, and I'm sure as soon as this panel is over, I will be, oh, wait. Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> I just well, started. I'll throw one out for you. Um, not to sound pretentious, but this will, but the witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth okay. are really interesting to me. Um, I have a theater background, a degree in theater, and, and uh, I. I first discovered this play when I was a senior in high school, way, way long ago. Um, and through a winding way, I, I had discovered during that year that if I read literature on my own, not when it's assigned, but just read it to enjoy it, it's actually really good when you're not being forced to analyze it. <laughs> and, and so that year I started devouring stuff and, and somewhere along the line, I thought, I wonder if this Shakespeare stuff is good because I hated Romeo and Juliet because I was forced to read it and, and Hamlet and all. So I read Macbeth and loved it. And then, uh, and then over the course of my education uh, in a theater degree, I became very well acquainted with Shakespeare. And I was actually in a, uh, I wasn't Macbeth, but I was in Macbeth. We did it. And so I've, one of the cool things, all of this is to say that one of the really cool things is that it's those witches along with all the other characters, but those witches are portrayed in every possible way you could think of. I, there, there's the classic example, you know, the classic version of Shakespeare where they're really old hags who are, you know, just horrible, twisted things. Uh, I've seen it done where they are like high-powered businesswomen, in, in, you know, especially in the 80s in, in shoulder pad suits and all that. Um, when we did it in college, of course, we were in college, so we were all like 20 something and, and uh, I forget who, who the director was, but um, the, the witches were more seductresses. So they, they got like the three most beautiful women we had in the, in the theater department, put them in sexy outfits, but made all their makeup like horribly like zombie-fied bloody gore, uh, wearing really like scantily clad things. And so they were seducing Macbeth and his wife into doing everything. And, and so I've seen, uh, and I just find it fascinating. It's the same text. It never changes. Yeah. But the different time periods, the different people, the cultures that are putting on the performance, you will get all these different interpretations of what these women look like and behave like. So I throw that out there. Well, and it is fascinating to see, and that's one of the reasons we did this panel, is the different portrayals of witches, both as a culture, like you said, for Turkey, or from the perspective of what time period are you writing them in? Yeah. And do they have to hide or do they have, to, or can they be out in the open? Um, you know, if you were always a practitioner, but sort of said, oh, well, it's just for fun, people were fine with it. But if you took your craft too seriously, then you were, could be hunted. You know, there's all these different ways to portray it. And, and as we as writers get to play with all of that, which mm -hmm. is super fun. Um, as a closing, let's uh, maybe say uh, a little bit about where we can find you on the web and what, what's your next book. Pat, why don't we start with you? Um, my next book won't be until next spring, and I'm still having troubles with the titles of them. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think the first one will be The Librarian Spell, because the, in, in my witchy world, all the witches write journals so they can learn from each other over the ages. So this will be the librarian who's in control of these journals. Cool. And you know, can, can help people. Uh, but uh, the School of Magic is the, 
the series. And you can find me on the web under Patricia Rice and uh, on Facebook under what official Patricia Rice or something ridiculous like that. You know, just 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 type Patricia Rice into Google and you'll find me somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find her on Twitter too, because that's where I see her all the time. <laughs> I, I, I'm there. Yeah, I'm on a, on, a, on a news diet right now. I'm not reading much. <laughs> Rachel, what about you? Where can we find you? Yeah, I, I was actually going to search for her on Twitter. Um, I am at <laughs> rachelgraves.com, and I am in Instagram, author Rachel Graves, and Facebook. Um, my most recent book was Dead Man's Detective, and that just came out mid-August. And my next one will be Hollywood Dead, uh, which comes out in December. Oh, I have our, uh, advanced reviewer copies going up in November. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, one of the things that Pat said reminded me of the Amazing Libromancer series, which if we're going to argue what defines a witch, I think the Libromancer book should be thrown in there. Okay, we can, anyway, who, yeah. Who writes them? <laughs> who writes them? I do not remember, but they're really great because they're witches who open a book and they can pull anything from the book's pages. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's about five of them out there. So says, says the girl with the library degree. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm at rachelgraves.com, Facebook and Instagram, and I'm also on Goodreads. I read about three books a week. So if you need more books in your TB Red pile, I've got your back. Awesome. Theresia? Very cool, Rachel. I'm going to take you up on that. Because um, I'm always looking for something to add to the never ending to be read, pal. Um, well, if you can spell my name, you can find me on the internet, basically. So um, I'm on Twitter as Theresia, at Theresia. Um, Instagram, Theresia Glass. My website is TheresiaGlass.com. I'm also on Facebook. Uh, Mostly, I'm not on Instagram as much simply because I just post pictures of my dogs or my food out there instead of pictures of me because I don't like <laughs> me most of the time. So I'll just post things that I take pictures of, which is mainly not me. Uh, so I, I'm usually found ranting on Twitter these days. And uh, my next book is a cosplay romance that is uh, behind schedule. So I am um, working on that and trying to get that done and turned in. Yay. Can't wait for that. Stuart, what about you? Uh, you can find me at stuartjaffe.com. On social media, I'm mostly on Facebook. At, just look up Stuart Jaffe. Everything's on Amazon. All my books are in ebook, print, and audiobook mostly. And uh, as far as what's coming out, uh, there's always something coming out. I, I, uh, I think I have a comic book coming out actually next in a few weeks, if all goes well. And then. Um, uh, later this year, the 10th of the my Nathan Kaye action thriller fantasy series comes out. And the next Max Porter and all that will be up next year. Uh, and then the trilogy I was talking about through Fall Stuff, will, all three of them will be released next year. I think starting March, one a month until they're all out. So lots going on. Don't you have a series where the witches are looking for their successors? Uh, well, so I have a series, they're, they're not witches. I have a series called The Parallel Society, which is about a gal who works in her, her family bookstore. And she learns that grandma and grandma's two elderly friends have been saving the universe for decades and decades. It's hard to keep that up with a bad back and arthritis. So they want her to take over. Uh, and that series has four out right now. There'll be seven total when it's all said and done. I need um, a title. The first one is called uh, The Infinity Caverns. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for, for checking it out. <laughs> and I'm Jeannie Adams, and you can find me on the web uh, at genieadams.com. And my next book is coming out September 25th, so it will be out by the time this airs. And it's a novella in Trick or Treat at Canem Castle. As Theresia said, uh, we did a series of uh, novellas together in Canem Castle at Christmas last year, and that was called typically Christmas at Canem Castle. And so this is this year is the trick-or-treat version of that, that anthology. So that'll be out, and I'll have another Witches Walks uh, book series out after the first of the year. So, And I've just signed with Falstaff Books to do um, space opera, so with Nancy Northcott. So, and well, that is going to be fun. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you being here. And 
that's all for Continuals Panel Room tonight. I'm off to add to my TBR pile. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Me too. Now we'll, now we'll see.